Now, back to the show. Back to the show. Okay? This is the kind of party stuff we're going to have later on. We're about to do a song that has been an incredible, thank God, a big, big, big hit for me in South Africa. When you meet that special person, that's the one that you will call your queen of hearts. I know that life's a gamble, but I'm always game to play. Yet when it comes to love, my friend, luck just turns away. always missing when I pick up the cards tomorrow will be Valentine Ahmad Najwa's son for a seed your daddy was shot come on by and to have that phone call that say your dad is not he didn't make it Talib would never have opened up the door if it was somebody unfamiliar to him so this must have been somebody that he really knows. Hi everyone, welcome to or welcome back to my channel and thank you very much for joining me here again today. Last week we spoke about the absolutely tragic case of the Donnybrook killer and if you haven't seen that I will link it up here for you. But that case was about a man who was raised to see a lot of violence and sadly he chose the same path and this man took it out on those who were in his own community. But this case that we are talking about today is probably known to a lot of you if you live in Cape Town or in South Africa. But this case is about an incredibly talented and well-loved musician in Cape Town, South Africa named Talib Peterson. And this case to me seems like it was based around a lot of greed, possession and how someone could just completely disregard human life and how those you know are often the deadliest. But with that being said, let's get into today's case. Intended for mature audiences only. Today we're heading to the beautiful city of Cape Town in South Africa and specifically the multicultural neighborhood of District 6. District 6 in Cape Town has a lot of sad and violent history and was home to many merchants, artisans and so on. But during apartheid, a lot of these people were forcibly removed from their homes, just like so many other people in our country. But after 1994, this area was rezoned by the government and the government tried to give back as many houses as they could to the people who could prove that they lived there back in the day. But, like many things, and including the District 6 rezoning attempt, it's not perfect and there are many things that have gone wrong, but the government is trying to do better. But District 6 is such a protected cultural hub in Cape Town, and the historical legacy of District 6 is shown by the painters, the artists, and everyone who tries to capture the vibe and the spirit that is District 6. But, in this area, on the 15th of April, 1950, a little boy named Abdul Motalib Peterson was born in District 6 and he would then grow on to be affectionately known as Talib Peterson. And according to sources, Talib Peterson absolutely loved music. He lived and breathed music even as a young child and apparently he performed the first time at the age of six or seven years old, not just on the street, not in his mom's lounge, but at the Cape Carnival. So this little boy had incredibly big dreams, even at a young age. And during Talib's developing years, he really honed in on this musical skill that he had. And he tried to perfect it as much as he could. During his late teens to his early 20s, Talib Peterson did move to London in order to learn how to play classical guitar. And he stayed there for a few years until he learned how to play it professionally. And then by the age of 24, Talib was performing in musicals such as Hair, and Jesus Christ Superstar. After Talib came back from London and after he performed in his musicals, he wrote his first piece of music, and I say this in air quotes because I'm sure that he doodled a lot more down on paper, but this was his first recorded piece of music that he put out there to a record company. But this single was called Carnival a la District 6. And in 1986, a man named David Kramer noticed this young rising superstar named Talib 
and they met up, they hung out, and they really got to know each other very well. They became thick and fast friends, and they created wonderful, magical musicals together. And these musicals would not only be shown here in South Africa, but they would be shown on Broadway, they would be shown in London. So they were very famous and popular musicals. So some pretty good stuff from this duo. And then in 1999, David Kramer and Tully Peterson won the Best New Musical Award. And this was for the musical called Cat and the Kings. So these two were great, and that's simply said. But if we go back a little bit, so we know how successful Talib and David will be with their fantastic musicals and singing and all of that. But if we go back to 1987, while Talib and David were hosting auditions for a musical that they had just written, a young lady walked into the theater hoping to audition for Talib's musical named Madikha. And Madikha and Talib basically headed off. And this couple spent 10 years together before they decided to get married. And because Talib Peterson was a practicing Muslim, Madikha was not. So she then converted and the couple then got married. And the couple did end up having children together. They had three girls and one boy. And then in the late 90s, before Talib got his award for the musicals, things were getting really rocky between the couple. Madikha and Talib were fighting quite a lot and things were a bit tense in the house. But Madikha and Talib did share a mutual friend. And this mutual friend would come over to the house and she would spend time with Madikha. But then she started coming to the house when Madikha wasn't there. And she just started spending time with Talib, apparently. And this mutual friend of theirs, her name was Najwa Dirk. And it is incredibly frustrating talking about this case when you know what is going to happen. I don't know if you know about the butterfly effect, but I wonder if this is one of those parts where one incident turned out to have a catastrophic event down the line. So could it be one of those butterfly effect times? I don't know. But anyway, let's get back to the story. So Najwa Dirk would come to the house now when Madikha wasn't there and Talib was just there, apparently. But I assume one thing led to another. And this Najwa Dirk was actually in the process of separating from her current husband. And Najwa and her current husband had two sons together. But Najwa Dirk and her husband were incredibly wealthy. They apparently owned some type of fruit distribution company where they would distribute fruit. But there were a lot of rumors that there were a lot of side jobs that Najwa and her husband would apparently partake in. So there was a lot of money coming in and out. So by 1997, Madikha and Talib had officially divorced. But there were never any confirming reports that an affair ever took place. So it was only speculation. But after Talib and Madikha divorced, Talib then moved into a small flat that was owned by Najwa's family. And by the way, Madikha and Talib would share custody of their children and they would share custody until they started getting older. So basically when they were young, it was two weeks at Talib, two weeks at Madikha. And then as the children started getting older, they then decided where they wanted to stay and where they would move between mom and dad's house. But eventually Najwa Dirk then moved in with Talib Peterson and the flat that Najwa and Talib lived in, Najwa's two sons also moved into the house. And like I said, then Talib's children would come and go as they pleased. So they would sometimes live there and then they sometimes wouldn't. So with Talib and Najwa, they actually did end up getting married. But things were rocky between the couple from the beginning. Firstly, Talib and Najwa invited none of their families to the initial first two weddings. And yes, I say first two because they actually ended up getting married three times. So the first two times... Najwa and Talib actually ended up getting married through cultural marriages. And then the third time was legal marriage via the government, signing the actual paper at like home affairs. But Talib Peterson was very, very private about his private life. He wouldn't tell a lot of people about his relationship, what was going on in his relationship. And it wasn't very big news in the tabloids either. So maybe because Talib was so private, maybe that's why his family didn't come to the first two weddings. Or maybe something else was actually brewing. But near the end of 1999, Najwa and Talib ended up having a young daughter together named Zainab. And Talib Peterson absolutely loved all of his children. He was a very good father, apparently, and he was very hands-on with his children. But if we are being quite blunt, things in the home were getting a lot worse. Apparently, Najwa had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder and severe depression. 
and Najwa's behavior was becoming incredibly erratic and also very unpredictable. And sadly, in 2003, Najwa tried to take her own life by swallowing all of her medication at once. And as soon as Talib and his family found Najwa and they found how sick she really was, he took all of her medication and he put it inside a medicine cabinet. He locked the medicine cabinet and he kept that key safe at all times. And he would then distribute the medicine when it said on the label that she actually needed it. And when Talib was not there because he was traveling or working, the oldest member in the family who was at the house at the time would then be responsible for giving Najwa her medication. So if we take a step back, Talib Peterson, his name is in lights. He's an incredibly famous playwright, musician, artist, and things are so successful in his career path, but things are taking a turn for the worse back home. But then in 2005, Madikha, who remember was Talib's ex-wife and mother to his four children, Madikha and Talib then started texting each other because before their divorce didn't really end very amicably. So they would talk, but it was mostly just about the children and that was it. But in 2005, the ex-couple then started to talk again and they would talk about each other. They would talk about how each other are doing. However, in 2006, Najra was then readmitted to a psychiatric hospital because she needed treatment for her severe depression. So early 2006, Najwa is put into a psychiatric hospital, around three months after she was released. So April the 13th, 2006, and just as a side note, this was two days before Talib's birthday, 13th of April 2006, the same day that Najwa was released from the psychiatric hospital, one of Talib's children walked into the house. She had then come into the house and she noticed that Najwa was sitting on the edge of a bed of one of the children's bed on the second story and Najwa was just sitting there. So her stepdaughter then walked in and they were just talking. They were talking about how she was feeling and she said that Najwa seemed perfectly fine. She seemed happy. She seemed calm and nothing was out of the ordinary at all. So Talib's daughter then went back downstairs, she then went to bed, and she then fell asleep. But then she was awoken by a light knocking on her door, and she woke up, she went to open her door, and there was her younger sister, Zainab, who is now staring at her, and she said that Talib is calling out for help, and she's very scared, and she's not quite sure what to do. So Talib's older daughter then went into the room where she thought that Talib was lying, and she then put her ear to the door and she then heard Talib shout, no, Najwa, no. So one of Talib's older daughters then storms through the door. The room is then only lit up by the flashing of the TV. She then stops, turns on the light in the room. And what she is met with is an absolutely horrific sight. And this sight is her stepmother, Najwa, kneeling on the bedroom floor with a knife in her hand. And at the other end, in the corner of the bedroom, is Talib absolutely fearful for his life, holding his stomach because there's blood everywhere. His top is absolutely soaked. So Talib is absolutely frightened. He is then trying to kick himself closer into the corner of the wall, absolutely scared for his life. Talib then sees that his daughter is now in the room, so he kind of relaxes a little bit. But he then looks at Najwa. Najwa then looks at Talib's daughter and Talib's daughter said that Najwa looked absolutely possessed. She had nothing going on in her eyes. It was cold and it was absolutely dead inside. And at the same time that Talib's daughter came into the room, Talib Peterson and Najwa had a live-in domestic worker and she too came into the room. She then saw that what was going on. Talib then asked her to take the knife out of Najwa's hand and the domestic worker was like, oh, I don't really want to do that. But she managed to grab the knife out of her hand and then Talib asked her to just take it away, clean it and then put it somewhere safe which she did. This case was never reported to the police. Talib did manage to get help. He did manage to get to an ambulance and they kept this very hush hush. But as soon as Talib managed to recover slightly inside the hospital, Najwa was then sent to the psychiatric hospital again. And this was for a further three weeks. When Najwa returned after the three weeks, the children never wanted to stay in that house again. And if they did, they now all had a lock and a very secure bedroom. So if they stayed in the house, they would lock it and they would not want to be close to Najwa at all. Talib also slept in a separate bedroom where Talib then took Zainab at night and they would then sleep in the one room and Najwa would sleep alone in the main bedroom. 
with everyone else locking their doors, including Talib. Now, all of Talib's children were not impressed that Talib was still with Najwa and still living in the house with Najwa. So there was a lot of tension, not only between Talib and Najwa, but between the children of both sides of the family. Now, I'm not sure how Najwa got it right, but while Najwa and Talib were together, Talib technically had no money, nothing on his name besides life insurance policies. So if I explain this, Najwa and Talib shared one account and Najwa would then take money and basically put an allowance into this account that Talib had access to. But this amount of money or allowance was only enough to cover the life insurance policy that Talib had. And basically all of the royalties, everything that Talib was earning was going into Najwa's bank account. So Talib had nothing. He didn't have anything from his previous marriage because Madikha actually took the house when the divorce was going through. So he had no property. He was busy living in Najwa's family's house. So that wasn't even his. And even though they were basically married in community of property, technically it wasn't even Najwa's house. So he had nothing. He might have been able to say that his money was going to Najwa, but I think that that would have been a very long and drawn out process. So I'm not sure if this was a agreement that they both agreed on, or if it was a lot of persuasion from Najwa's side. And eventually Talib just relented. But with this life insurance policy that Najwa was paying for into Talib's account, this life insurance policy was worth 5.5 million rand, back then, and there was only one beneficiary to this life insurance policy, and that was for Zainab, who was, remember, Talib's and Najwa's daughter. And basically, if anything happened to Talib, Najwa would then run this bank account or this money that would then be inherited until Zainab came of age. Okay, so if we go back to Najwa for a second, remember I said that Najwa's ex-husband was a fruit distributor, well, apparently she would get around 100,000 Rand from that every month and their like alimony situation. So she would get at least 100 grand then. But apparently there were also rumors that Najwa was involved in diamonds and transporting diamonds, apparently. And she was also apparently involved in the selling of US dollars illegally because she would make a profit off of this. So if we just recap, Najwa has now been released from her second psychiatric hold at a hospital after three weeks. The children are terrified of staying in the house with her and they are not comfortable that Talib and Najwa are still together. So a couple days after Najwa was now released from the psychiatric hospital, she then gets in contact with an ex-friend or very much an acquaintance of her ex-husband's and his name is Fahim Hendricks. And basically, Fahim and Najwa would go way back because she would lend Fahim money quite often and he would then try and pay her back as quickly as he could. And if he couldn't pay her back, then she would take some kind of collateral, being that his truck or whatever she could hold against him, she would take his collateral. So for him, one day when they were talking, Najwa reached out to him. They were just chatting about how everything was going. And for him then said to Najwa that actually he's looking to start up a new business and he wants to start up like a takeaway joint or something like that. So he asked Najwa while on the phone if he could then borrow 10 grand from Najwa. So Najwa's like, okay, fine, I'll give you the money. But if you can't pay it back this time, the collateral that I want is for you to kill someone. So at first for him was like, no, I'm not going to kill someone because I can't pay you back 10 grand. But apparently Najwa kept on calling him, kept on calling him. And eventually for him then relented and he said, okay, fine, I will take the 10 grand from you and then I will kill someone in exchange. So Najwa said to for him, find someone or you do it yourself. So for him then contacted someone who apparently just came out of prison and his name was Abdur Mjedi. And Najwa basically said to these two men, I will give you a hundred thousand rand if you can kill someone for me. And she kept saying someone. The person that they were there to apparently kill was not really named at first. So a couple days later, Najwa then went to Fahim's house. They started talking and Najwa then revealed who she wants Fahim to murder. And if you have not guessed it yet, yes, she wanted Fahim to murder her husband, Talib Peterson. Najwa apparently told Fahim that Talib wanted to divorce her, Najwa, 
and Najwa was having none of it. She said that Talib and her were married in community of property, so that means that he was entitled to half of everything that she had, even though she was actually holding some of Talib's money. But she didn't want this. She wanted all of the money for herself. So she needed this problem gone. So at the time that this whole plan was going down between Najwa and Fahim, Talib wasn't actually in South Africa. He was in London writing a play with David and he was going to come back at the end of December. So Talib was supposed to come home on December the 13th, 2006. And basically what Najwa had planned with Fahim is that she would go to the airport and then Fahim and Abdur would then come and pretend to hijack the couple and then they would kill Talib on the way home. So she apparently came up with some very violent plans in how her husband could be murdered. But Talib had been planning a performance with his son for months and months. And his son was incredibly excited to perform with his father. And that was supposed to take place on the 14th of December 2006. And luckily for Talib and his son, it did take place and it was apparently a magical event. But then on Saturday the 16th of December 2006, Najwa, Talib and all of their children were invited to Talib's niece's party and everyone went except Najwa. Najwa said that she wasn't feeling well and she wanted to stay home so she decided to stay home and Talib and all the children then went to Talib's niece's house. Talib was probably very tired from his performance a couple days before and also his travels. So he didn't stay at the niece's house for too long. He ended up getting home at about 10 p.m. that night. And when Talib got home, Najwa was lying in her bed and Najwa and Talib then decided to pray together. And Talib wanted to pray because he felt that his wife was not well and he really wanted any help he could get in order to get his wife up and better again. While the couple were praying, Najwa's son and Talib's stepson came back to the house with his now wife and infant child and they walked past the room when they saw Talib and Najwa praying and they then went into their room and locked the door and went to sleep. So after praying Najwa then ran a bath, she put a lot of candles around the bath and then she heard Talib walking past the bathroom door. She put her ear to the door, she kind of heard what he was doing and if you live with someone, your parents, your partner, you know their habits so you know what certain noises mean in the house and she knew that Talib was going up to his bedroom to either go to sleep or watch TV but she knew that he was in that specific room. And the reason why she was listening at the door was because she was busy notifying and calling people specifically for him and Abdur to let them know exactly what was happening and exactly where her husband would be in the house. So Abdur Neji and Fahim Hendricks, they had now decided to ask two other guys from Hanover Park and ask them to kind of be in on the plan and they would give them a couple grand in order to rob someone. But they only let one person out of these two guys from Hanover Park know exactly what the plan was and who they were there to kill. The other person in this duo apparently knew nothing about the murders, but this is all apparent. So the two men from Hanover Park was named Wahid Hassan and Jefferson Snyders. So Jefferson and Wahid then drove to Talib Peterson's house and Najwa said to Fahim, that the door would be unlocked, the front gate would be unlocked, so just come right in and the security system will all be off. So Wahid and Jefferson from Hanover Park knew via for him that they could just enter the home and they were strictly instructed where to go up the stairs and what room Talib would specifically be in and apparently where all the money would be. Then at around 11.50 p.m. on the 16th of December 2006, two masked men then ran up the stairs and pushed their way into Talib Peterson's room. Jefferson Snyders had cable ties with him in his bag and Wahid Hassan had a gun. Jefferson apparently had no idea that Talib Peterson was going to be murdered that night. He only thought that he was there for robbery. But apparently while Wahid and Jefferson were in the room with Talib, Jefferson was tying him up with cable ties and then Najwa walked into the room. As soon as Talib saw Najwa, he knew instantly that she was involved with this and Najwa then apparently tried to hug Talib and he just kind of tried to headbutt her away. He didn't want her near him at all. Wahid then asked Najwa if there was anyone else in the house. Najwa then said yes, it's her son and their young daughter Zainab. So Wahid then said, okay, take me to your son. 
Najwa then led Wahid to the bedroom of her son. She then knocked on the door. She asked them to open and then Wahid pushed past Najwa, walked into the room and held a gun to all of them, robbed them of all of their possessions, including 2,000 rand. And then he looked at the infant child as well with the gun in his hand. He paused at the child, looked at him and then walked out of the room. Najwa was apparently hysterical and crying, but maybe because this was actually her family that could be hurt or she was just pretending, we'll never know. And remember, Zainab was still in the house, their seven-year-old daughter at the time, and she was sleeping downstairs in the house. And while Wahid and Najwa were at Najwa's son's door robbing them, Jefferson was still in the room with Talib, and Jefferson was apparently wiping away Talib's tears. He was trying to wipe the blood off of Talib's face, because apparently when Najwa tried to hug Talib and he tried to headbutt her away, Wahid got really angry and punched him in the face and probably broke his nose because blood was pouring out of his nose. So Jefferson was actually trying to clean this up for him and wipe away his tears, but he was still cable tying Talib Peterson to the bedroom floor. Then, while Jefferson was still trying to wipe away the blood, Wahid and Najwa then entered back into the room. Wahid then said to Jefferson, go and give me a pillow and also get out and go be a lookout. So Jefferson knew that something was going to go down. He then handed the pillow over to Wahid and he then left the room, left the house and stood lookout in the front lawn. Talib Peterson knew instantly that when this pillow was being brought over to him, that something terrible was going to happen. Apparently, Talib's last movements and last words were that he was rocking back and forth and he was saying a prayer. Wahid then apparently folded the pillow in half, put the gun in the pillow and then hesitated. And this is all speculation and all probably he said, she said. But because Wahid hesitated at pulling the trigger of a man that was kneeling on the ground and praying and crying, apparently Najwa then put her hand into the pillow over Wahid's hand and then she pulled the trigger. But this is all hearsay. Najwa then made Wahid lock her and Zainab into one bedroom where she then waited a couple of minutes before she then called family members to tell them that they had been robbed. Najwa then played the role very well and she was given a very heavy sedative by the family doctor before police came there. So police couldn't actually interview her when they came to the house because she was highly sedated. The first family member to arrive was Talib Peterson's brother and he was the first one to find his brother dead in his room with his hands and feet bound. According to Talib Peterson's religion, he was then laid to rest within 24 hours after his death and 24 hours after he was brutally gunned down in his own home. Now Talib Peterson was massive in South Africa and South Africa mourned his loss. And while people mourned the South African icon, police were really trying their best in order to solve this case. And there was a lot of pressure on them to solve this case. But while police were busy looking at this case, they noticed one thing. And that was a police officer had written down that the first thing that he noticed from Najwa when they kicked down the door to rescue her when she was locked in the room was that she had two cell phones on her. And he thought that this was really strange. He said, apparently, according to Najwa, they Two guys came in, masked, they opened the safe, they took 20,000 rand, they then robbed and killed her husband, as well as her children downstairs, and he found this so strange. She still had two cell phones when the perpetrators apparently forced her into this room. Surely they would have felt the two phones. So police read this. They then went to Najwa and they said, we want your two cell phones. So Najwa then handed them the two cell phones, and it was clear that she tried to delete a lot. She deleted a lot of text messages, calls, but police still had the ability to see who she contacted. And they noticed that she contacted Fahim over 50 times, be that within two days prior to the murder and two days after the murder. So over 50 times over these five days, two days before, two days after and on the day. Fahim Hendricks was then called into questioning. And police instantly noticed that Fahim was probably the best person to try and crack because he was very erratic, he was very nervous, and police really thought that they could get through to him. But because police really had no evidence besides all of these calls, they had to release Fahim. But six months after the crime had taken place, Fahim cracked and he couldn't actually handle the pressure anymore and he then spilled everything to the police. So then, in June of 2007, Fahim Hendricks confessed everything to the police 
And because of his confession, he was granted complete immunity and he was put into witness protection program. So because of Fahim's confession, Najwa, Abdur, Jefferson, and Wahid were all arrested and charged with the murder of Talib Peterson. The charges included murder and robbery, and all four of them pleaded not guilty. During the trial, the judge didn't believe that Najwa was ill or had any mental health issues. He felt that she was cold, callous, and manipulative. Najwa made sure that she had all of Talib's money and made sure that she controlled it. But in the end, Najwa Dirk was found guilty of murder and sentenced to 28 years in prison. Wahid Hassan and Abdur Mjedi were sentenced to 24 years in prison for robbery and murder. Jefferson Snyders was sentenced to 10 years in prison for robbery. In the result, accused number one is found guilty on count one, the merger charge. On one count of robbery with aggravating circumstances, she is found guilty. Accused number two is found guilty on count one, the murder charge. On one count of robbery with aggravating circumstances, he is found guilty. Accused number three is found guilty on counts one, two, and three, and on one count of robbery with aggravating circumstances. Accused number four is found not guilty and discharged on counts one, two, and three. He is found guilty on one count of robbery with aggravating circumstances. This is the unanimous decision of the court. It is senseless crimes like these that are so infuriating. Just take the money and leave. Now I understand that money is very important to a lot of people. It makes the world go round and it is exactly what we need basically to survive. And there may have been circumstances of Wahid, Abdur, Jefferson and for him that could have made them want to rob and murder. But there are a lot of people out in South Africa and around the world who are in horrible circumstances, but they would never ever go that way in order to survive. And I think that Najwa's greed was something that pulled her, it was something that overtook her, and it drew her into this life of wanting to murder her husband. But besides that, Abdur Mjedi, who remember was one of the accomplices in this whole murder with Fahim, he was actually released on parole in November of 2020 after only serving 11 years in prison for the murder of Talib Peterson. And yes, he wasn't technically involved in pulling the trigger, but he was one of the people who orchestrated the murder. It is just mind-boggling that we have rules in South Africa that people can be released after only serving around half of their sentence. I have nothing more to say on this before I get even more angry. So with that being said, have a fantastic day further. Have a fantastic weekend further. I hope that you're all staying safe. Thank you very much for everything. I really appreciate you all. And I'll see you again next week. Bye.